Hi, good day and welcome once again to our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our channel. Today we want to look at the NECO 2023 Agri Science Practical Specimen. The specimen that NECO has released for the forthcoming Agri Science Practical. So we we'll list all of the specimens and then we we'll talk about each of them. So we are starting with specimen A. Specimen A. Specimen A is the watering watering can. Then we have specimen B. Specimen B to be the plier. Then we have specimen C. Specimen C is the knapsack sprayer. Knapsack sprayer. That is what the specimen C is. And specimen D. We have the specimen D to be the litmus paper. Litmus paper. Specimen E now. We have the specimen E to be cow dung. And specimen F. Specimen F is limestone. Specimen G. Specimen G is the clay soil. Clay soil. Uh, specimen H. Uh, specimen H is yam. Yam tuba. We have specimen I. Uh, specimen I is cassava tuba. Then specimen J. Specimen J is orange fruit. We have specimen K to be ground nut cake. Specimen K is ground nut cake. And then we have specimen L. Specimen L is hides and skin. And lastly, we have specimen M. Specimen M. Which is, we have specimen L, M rather, to be the digestive tract. Digestive tract of a bed. So this is the list that Neko has chosen for their specimen. So we have specimen A to be watering can. Specimen B is the plier. Specimen C is the knapsack sprayer specimen D is litmus paper. We have specimen E to be cow dung. Specimen F to be limestone. Specimen G to be clay soil. Specimen H to be timber, tuba, uh, yam tuba rather. Then specimen I to be cassava tuba. Specimen J to be orange fruit. Then specimen K is granite cake. Specimen A L is hide and skin. And specimen M is the digestive, digestive tract of a bed so these are the uh, specimens that we'll be looking at and we'll be using all of them or we'll be explaining certain things about each of these we'll be looking at their properties their characteristic features their functions their uses as we come across each of them so let us pick it up and talk about start talking about them 
So we are going straight to the first one, which is our specimen A. Specimen A. Specimen A, which is the watering can. Watering can. So what is a, a watering can? What do we what's what's is a watering can and what is it used for? That is what we will be looking at right now. So watering can is a specific uh, is a container that can also be called other names now. It can also be called a watering pot or a sprinkling can. It can also be called a watering pot or a sprinkling can. It is made up of plastics. Can be made made from plastics. Plastics or metals and it can also be uh, made from ceramics so these are some of the uh, uh, components that are, can be used in the production or in the making of what we refer to as a watering can its major function is to water flowers function is to water flowers Or plants to water flowers or plant parts yes that is his major function is to water either in a nursery or on a field in a farm it could be used in the nursery or in a farm now they are of different sizes we have them ranging from sizes range from half a liter to about 10 liters so it depends on what uh, use you're using it for so it is used majorly to water plants by hand now the portable container it is a portable container with handle and funnel like I said that is a description for it a portable container with handle and sieve or funnel at its tip yes that is how we can describe it at the end of the spout yes it has something called the spout okay let me quickly show us what i'm talking about this is an example of uh what we refer to as a watering can yes this is an example of a watering can so we have other examples like this yes so let me use this to quickly explain something now if we look at this diagram here you can see it has a spout this year that i'm looking that i'm using the pointer to pick up this part here is what we refer to as the spout and at the tip here it has a rose or a sprinkler yes it is a mesh like material at the tip of this funnel here so it helps to spray the water preventing the water from just pouring on the spot on the plant when that happens when water pours on the spot on the plant it could weak, uh, destroy the plant particularly if the plant is uh is an herbaceous plant that does not have tick back so it could destroy the uh, the structure of that plant so that is why it is having a sprinkler system at the tip here so that is its function so back to what I was, I was trying to say that it has a spout yes and at the end of the spout there is a rose that is what i showed us just now at the end of this spout, there is a rose or a sprinkler a device like a cap with small holes yes and it can be placed to break up the stream of water into droplets to avoid excessive water pressure on the soil or delicate plant parts Yes, that is what that particular sprinkler is used for. So let me just make a list some parts, parts of the sprinkler now. Parts we have the container that contains the water. Then we have the spout. Those are the major parts. Then at the spout we have a cap, uh, a cap-like material, a cap-like material called a rose 
yes for sprinkling water that is the major function of the rose it is to sprinkle the water so that the water does not pour on a particular part of the plant preventing excess pressure on the soil or delicate plant parts so those are the uh, the parts of the plant of the watering can that we need to uh, take note of so if we understand this now let us quickly look at this there are some other uh, possible uses of the watering can apart from just using it to water uh, plants it can also be used other uses now can also be used to apply it can also be used to apply bitumen it can also be used to apply bitumen to asphalt when road is being built that black uh, liquid that is poured on road that has adhesive effect Yes, that is called bitumen. So it is used. The watering can can be used to apply that on the road, to do, uh, to make the road. Also, it can be used as ornamentals. Yes, it can be used as ornaments. It can be used as ornaments. Also, it can be used as symbolic art pieces. Used as symbolic art pieces so those are uh, major uh, uses of the watering can so like i showed us earlier on this is a picture of the watering can this is a picture of the watering can so we can have this we can have this also we can have it looking like this so this is uh, majorly the type that we probably are familiar with so this is a watering can like I've said and this is another watering can so if you are asked to draw and label this is what you are expected to draw for them so it has a, a handle sometimes it could be two handles then the bucket this one has a scale this one is made of plastic so you'll be able to see the level of the water inside the container then it has a rose holder, the sprinkler, the spout, and then the vessel. So that is that about the watering can. So our next uh, specimen is the plier, specimen B. Specimen B, that is the plier. So what is a plier? That is what we want to look at now. What is a plier? A plier is a substance or a machine. A, a machine, let's say a handheld device. A handheld device that is used to grip substances. A handheld device or tool used to hold. Or grip that is what it is used for used to hold or grip objects firmly to use to hold or grip objects firmly that is what it is used for yes it is possibly developed from tongues yes it's, it looks like a tongue uh, it is also used for handling or holding hot metals also used for handling or holding hot metals or materials. Now, the reason why it is used for holding hot metals or materials is because the plier is a, a, the, the major part of the plier is the metal, but it's has an handle or two handles that is insulated the handle is made of or the handle has insulation around it so it prevents the heat from the or a hot object or the hot material from passing across to the handles and getting the uh, handler burnt so this is what 
a plier looks like so if you look at this now you can see that this part here has metal now inside these handles too there are metals there but it has an outer coating and that is the rubber that we are seeing here uh, this uh, particular color the yellow and the hash color that we are seeing those are the uh, insulations that i talked about earlier on so the metal extends into these handles as well but because the metal here in the handle part is insulated with this rubber so it does not allow the heat to get the person handling it burnt so that is what it is so these are examples of pliers we have different types of pliers we have a nose plier we have a normal plier we have a cutter and the rest of the there, there are many types of plier this is a brick plier a, a cutter a nose plier and there are so many others so we need to understand that this is another example of a plier and this actually is showing some labelings we can see so we can see the grip here so on this as on this part here we can see on the tip here we have the grip then in this middle here there is the pipe grip that can be used to hold pipes then these are the jaws this place here and this place here they are the jaws then in this middle here we have a cutter like a knife edge that can be used to cut cables yes and there here we have the pivot that is where because this particular instrument is a uh we, we there, there's what we call levers and we have different types of lever this particular one is uh, a first class lever where we have the full chrome in the middle of the uh, object and the load yes we have the the full chrome between the sorry between the effort yes this is where the efforts are being applied so we have the efforts being applied on the handles having the full chrome in the middle here and the load is at the tip so it is referred to a plier is referred to as uh, a we call it uh, a first order lever so that is an example so like i was showing us these are uh, uh, labelings that can be found on uh, a plier yes labelings that can be found on a plier so let me quickly put that down so i said yes it can be used to hold all metals or materials because because of its insula insulation on the handles made of rubber yes so that is uh the major uh essence of it so it can be used in bending and physically compressing a wide range of materials can be used for bending and compression so it can be used to compress uh materials so you can actually use it to apply force on a particular material to compress it so that is it so the, the major let me put this has major uh majorly five parts so it has two handles it has one full chrome and it has two uh jaws this full crown can also be referred to as the pivot you can also refer to the full crown as the pivot that is where we have the two handles meeting to disperse into the jaws so we understand that so this is an example of what we have just talked about i believe we can see the diagram very well so please get familiar with that so the next specimen i want to talk about now is the knapsack sprayer the, the knapsack sprayer so let us quickly see what specimen c is specimen c oh, let me put it on a new page so we don't get ourselves confused knapsack sprayer specimen c So what is a knapsack sprayer? 
A knapsack sprayer is uh, a bucket-like material that is used in the application of uh, chemicals on a piece of land or on a farm. That is what it is used for. So it helps. Uh, it, it is a bucket-like material. I said a type of sprayer that dispenses liquid through a handheld nozzle that is attached to a pressurized reservoir carried on the operator's back. Yes, it is a type of sprayer. A sprayer that disperses liquid through a handheld through a handheld nozzle a handheld nozzle that is attached to a pressurized reservoir to a pressurized reservoir that is carried on the back of the operator carried on the operator's back Yes, that is what the knapsack sprayer is. It is used to apply liquids, liquids like liquid application. The type of liquids that can be used to apply, we use it to apply fertilizers. Yes, when we uh, liquefy the fertilizers, we can use it to apply fertilizers. We can use it to, uh, to apply herbicides to kill uh, certain unwanted weeds as well as uh, fungicides. You can use it to di uh, to dispense this as well, pesticides and the rest of those. So it can be used uh, or suited to spot treating. Yes, it can be used particularly to treat certain uh, areas on the field. So that is what the knapsack sprayer is. So let us quickly see. This is what a knapsack sprayer looks like. So this is the bucket. You can see this this particular part co uh, colored blue is the bucket then this yellow part is the uh the cover so it has a pressure uh pump here and then it has on the other side it has a lever that is being pumped to allow the liquid in the sack in the knapsack sprayer to pump out through this nozzle this thing this long one here is the nozzle so it is used that way. So let me give, let me quickly show us uh, another uh, example. This is another example. We'll be able to see it better here. So it is labeled here. You can see the nozzle. You can see the spray, uh, the spray lance. You can see the, ro the the rocker. That is what is being used to pump the air. They pull the rocker up and down. So the continuous pulling of the rocker is what gives the pressure into the uh, the, the tank and uh, permits the fluid or the liquid to run through the hose out of the nozzle. So that is how it is being uh, utilized. That is how it is being used. So that is that about the, uh, the knapsack sprayer. So let me quickly list its parts for us, a few of the parts. Even if we can already see it, the, the major part, we have the nozzle made of metal. Nozzle. We have the tank. We have the belt. Yes, it needs to be fastened to the operator's back. So majorly, these are the uh, common parts of the knapsack sprayer. So if you need to understand, if you need to know its labels, please kindly check this diagram so that is that about the knapsack sprayer so our next specimen is specimen d specimen d which happens to be our specimen d happens to be the litmus paper specimen d 
and that is litmus paper so what is a litmus paper a litmus paper is a test paper a test paper that is used to test uh the ph of a substance that is what it is used for it is used to test test the ph of a substance to know if that substance is acidic or alkaline in nature if it is acidic or a basic so it is a filter paper a filter paper or test paper treated with some chemicals chemicals like okay let me say treated with a leaching A leaching provided a leaching provided natural soluble natural soluble there yes that is what it is made from it produces results used as pH Yes, when you use a filter, uh, a litmus paper to test a substance, it gives a result that is used as that is uh, uh, a, a direct representation of the pH of that substance. So produces results used as pH indicator. Yes, so it is used to test, like I said earlier on, it is used to test or assess whether a substance is acidic or basic. To test if a substance is acidic or basic. That is what uh, the litmus paper is, so basic as in alkalinity. It is either basic or alkaline in nature. So this is what a pH looks like. This is a uh, sorry, yeah, a litmus paper. So we have basically two types of litmus paper. We have the blue litmus paper and the red litmus paper. Those are the types of litmus paper that we have. So we can see this here. These are examples of the test papers. So this one here, the red, is used to test. Uh, alkaline substances when you dip the red into an alkaline substance it will give a color change from red to blue and when you use the blue when you dip the blue into an acidic substance it will turn the blue to red that is the result that we see so if you dip the blue into an alkaline substance there will be no color change likewise if you dip the red into an acidic substance there will be no color change the only color changes here will be blue being dipped into acid and it will be turned to red and the red being dipped uh, into acid and then it turns to blue so we can see that here when they are being used for a uh, sample so this is an example of what the test looks like so when you dip the substance this is a blue litmus paper when you put the blue litmus paper into an acidic solution you can see as it is labeled here you put it into an acidic solution you can see the blue litmus paper turning into red and on this other side here the red litmus paper is dipped into a basic solution and it turns the red litmus paper into blue and here we have a universal indicator this one is graded from 0 to 14 so when you put the ph indicator or universal ph indicator into a substance it gives a complementary color which we have to match with the uh, pH probe, which is the uh, pH uh, uh, meter. So when you match it with the pH meter, it gives a match on the color patches on the pH meter, and that identifies the type of uh, solution or the type of substance that you have actually tested on. So that is what the pH, uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, sorry, the litmus paper is about. This is an example of what we are talking about the red litmus paper and the blue litmus paper. So let us go to the next specimen, which is specimen E. Specimen E. And specimen E is cow dung. 
specimen E is cow dung. So what can we say about specimen E? What can we say about specimen E? When we look at specimen E, we just said it is a cow dung. So majorly it is seen as a manure. It is seen as manure. It can be gotten from cows, uh, cow parts. It can also be called cow parts or cow manure. Yes, these are other names that people call the uh, the material or the specimen as it is in this scenario. Cow parts or cow manure. Now, it is not necessarily from man, uh, cows alone. Because a whole lot of uh, animals can produce this particular substance. So it is not from cows alone. Now, what are we actually saying here? We are saying that the waste produced by this, um, uh, this organism is what we refer to as cow dung. For example, let's uh, limit our discussion to that of the cows. So the waste product of the bovine animal, waste product of the bovine animal species, that is what we refer to as the cow dung. These species include, we could, we could be using waste from cattle, from bison, uh, from buffalo. So cow dung is the undigested. Okay, let me quickly put this down. Let's see. Let me show us what the cow dung actually looks like. This is what cow dung looks like. So we can see in this picture here, the, the feces or the fecal uh, uh, material of a cow that is what we refer to as cow dung let me show us another example you can see this one has been mashed already it has been mashed and used by uh mashed with a garden fork so this this is ready for uh for dispension this is this is ready to be used on the ma on the farm on plants or around the plants as the case is so i said that is waste product of bovine animal species. Waste products, sorry. Waste products of bovine animal species. E.g. we have the cow. Cow, we have the bison, we have buffalo, etc. So all of these are animals that can produce this uh, this uh, dung. So we said cow dung is undigested, undigested residue of plants undigested residue of plants of plant matter which has passed through the animal's guts which has passed through the animal guts yes those are the uh uh, waste that has been gotten out of the uh, animal. So the resultant fecal matter is rich in minerals. Very rich in minerals. Very rich in minerals. Minerals that are required by plants. Used majorly to improve fertility of soil. Minerals used majorly. to improve sorry used majorly to improve soil fertility that is what it is majorly used for so it is used to improve soil fertility and then when dried can be used as fill yes these are other uses now other uses When dry, used as fuel. Yes, it can also be used uh, uh, to coat floors. 
also used for coating floors and walls of mud houses. Yes, these are uh, mud houses or huts. These are some other uses of uh, of the dung. Yes, because this is believed. It is believed to improve interior hygiene. It is believed to improve interior hygiene of the house. Interior hygiene. And repel insects. And repel insects. So these are some of the uh, reasons why people actually use it to, uh, to coat the floors of their compound. So this is what you are actually talking about. Cow dung so that is that about uh, specimen e our next specimen is going to be specimen f specimen f and what is our specimen f okay our specimen f is limestone limestone that is our specimen f so what do we have to talk about Limestone, or what do we have to discuss about limestone? First and foremost, let me show us what limestone looks like. This is what limestone looks like. This is what limestone looks like. So, let me magnify this a bit. We can see this. That is what limestone looks like. It is actually a stone material that is rich in minerals like the calcite and the aragonite yes minerals okay when we say limestone it is also calcium trazocarbonate can also call it calcium carbonate or calcium trazocarbonate so i said it is a carbonate sedimentary rock a carbonate yes because it is a rock sedimentary rock yes with main source of lime which has a main source of lime lime that is calcium oxide yes so it forms okay the minerals in it minerals found minerals we have the calcite we have the calcite as well as the aragonite so these are the minerals that can be found in the uh, calcium trouser carbonate or the sedimentary uh, rock calcite and aragonite so I said it forms when these minerals precipitate it forms when the minerals when these minerals precipitate minerals like calcite and aragonite when they precipitate that is when the uh, limestone forms and it forms to precipitate out of water precipitate out of water containing dissolved calcium containing dissolved calcium so that is what limestone is it is used in okay uses now uses used in manufacturing of steel uh, manufa it is used in steel manufacturing yes to manufacture manufacture steel it is also used in mining We also use it in uh, paper production. Yes, these are points where we make use of uh, limestone. We also use it in uh, water treatment and purification. Water treatment and purification. 
yes when you allow it to get into a water body it coagulates the death in that uh, water purification as well as in the production of uh, plastics so it is also used to manufacture glass and in agriculture also used to manufacture glasses manufacture glasses and in agriculture so these are some of the uses of uh, the limestone that is specimen f calcium carbonate so let us uh, get that so this is an example of what we are talking about uh, this is another example of the the rock so that that is limestone calcium carbonate so we need to understand that so our next specimen now is going to be specimen g specimen g and what is specimen g specimen g is clay soil clay soil yes so what do we have to say about clay soil clay soil is one of the major uh, soil types we have three major soil types uh, we have the uh, the sandy okay let me just quickly list them soil types now soil types we have sandy clay and loamy so these are the three major soil types so we are discussing the clay soil today that is the one we want to discuss the clay soil is the one we are discussing so what is the clay soil yes it is a part uh, a powdery soil that has low properties now properties of clay soil it has uh, low porosity yes because it does not allow water to pass through it it does not uh, uh, sorry it has uh, well, let me let me say very very low porosity because it does not have it does not allow water to pass through it it has high retention of water high water retaining capability high water retention it has let me say average or moderate Oh, should I let me not even say average or more well, let me leave it that way or moderate or let me say relatively low relatively low relatively low humus content yes because the content of humus in it is not as high as that that is found in the loamy soil Yes, I said it has low porosity because sandy soil has the highest porosity. And this clay soil does not permit water to run through it. It holds water. So it doesn't allow water, it doesn't drain easily. That is what you are trying to say. It has low organic matter in it. It has low organic matter. So those are some of the properties of the clay soil. Use it now. It is majorly used by potters. For pottery works. Yes, that is one major use of the clay soil. It is used by potters for pottery works. It is used in um, it is used in making huts. Uh, clay pots and bricks so those are the major it is very very it is not good at all for uh, uh, planting it is not good for agricultural uh, purposes at all so that is about the clay soil so let me quickly show us what the clay soil looks like this is an example of the clay soil we can see this here Okay, let me quickly show us this first. So we can see this type of soil. Sometimes it has this red color or uh, brown color. That is the color of the clay soil. So that is how it looks. We can also see this here. So 
here i'm showing uh, a comparison between the three soil types you can see sandy soil here and in the middle we have loamy soil and that the last one here is the clay so you can see the brown or the red uh, color of the soil type so that is that about the uh, specimen G our next specimen now is specimen H specimen H which is yam specimen H which is yam yam tuba yes it is a plant so let me quickly give us its uh, botanical name its botanical name is Manihot Esculenta. Manihot Esculenta. Manihot Esculenta. Yes, that is its botanical name. So let me quickly give us its classification it is from the kingdom plantae yes uh, the class is it is uh, a tracheophyte a tracheophyte it is from the order the mapuchales Uh, from the family, we have the family to be Ephobiade. Yes, that is its family. So we have the genus to be Manihot, and the species is uh, Esculenta. So it has okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, the botanical name oh sorry 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 the botanical name i have quickly uh, made a mismatch please what we have here is let me quickly correct that i was already uh, moving a step fast sorry for that the botanical name for yam is diaspora uh -huh. diaspora Alata, yes, that is its botanical name. Dyscoria alata, that is its own botanical name. So it is also Kingdom Plantae uh, and the rest of those. So we have uh, other types of yams. If this one is the uh, Dyscoria alata, that is a common yam that we have. We have other types of uh, yam species. We have uh, Dyscoria communis, we have the Dyscoria esculentus, which we eventually talk about. We have Discoria rotunda. We have uh, the uh, Discoria cayenensis. Yeah, let me just list them here. Other species. Other species. Other species. We have uh, Discoria communis. We have the scoria. So when we want to write the uh, short form, we just do this. The scoria esculentus. We have the scoria esculentus. We have the okay. we have the diascoria uh, rotundata. Rotundata. We have the scoria uh cayenensis yes that is another one rotunda cayenensis those are examples of uh the Dioscuria uh, species so the family is called the, the uh Dioscuriaceae. that's the family the family of uh the yam tuba so it is a root tuba yes a root tuba with creeping stem a root tuber with creeping stem very rich in carbohydrates 
a root tuber rich in carbohydrates it is a perennial herbaceous plant a perennial plant because it does not uh, complete its life cycle in one planting season it completes it in more than one planting uh, more than one or even two planting seasons so it is a perennial herbaceous yes because its leaves the plant's stem itself has leaves it is a perennial herbaceous uh, plant so this plant has vines yes sometimes it can be spiky yes so it is a monocot yes that is another uh, characteristic it is a monocot meaning it has uh, one seed leaf and then it is popularly grown or mostly uh, cultivated in temperate regions that is an environment that is relatively warm in temperate regions that is where the uh, the scoria alata is uh, often cultivated so this is what the scoria alata looks like let me quickly show us what the scoria alata looks like so we have this this is what the scoria alata looks like you can see it. that's the yam as we know it this is another example of yam so we can see this as well so that is the scoria alata for us so let us move to the next one which is specimen I specimen I which is cassava uh, tuba cassava tuba now before I go further yam can be eaten raw uh, I mean ordinarily when cooked or roasted and you can also use it to make uh, uh, meshed yam that is uh, pounded yam as the case is so those are the functions of all the things that we make use of yam for you can use yam in any of those uh in any of those ways you can use yam in any of those ways so uh so to uh cassava tuba now to cassava tuba it is uh its botanical name like i said earlier on is the money hut The money hot esculenta. Money hot esculenta. That is the botanical name of uh, the cassava plant. Yes, so like I wrote earlier on, the kingdom is plantae uh, class is tracheophytes. The class is tracheophytes. The order now. We have the order to be. Uh, we have the order to be. Mapetalis. Then we have the fa the family. The family is. Sorry, let me write this well so it is uh, visible. We have the family to be if we Yes, that is the family. So the cassava now we say it is very high in calories. Very high in calories. It is also a perennial crop. It is perennial. Uh, it is extensively cultivated as annual. Uh, as annual crop even though it is not really an annual crop so it is uh, a perennial crop crop uh, excessively extensively cultivated now uh, in the raw form the raw form contains high amounts of cyanide Yes, it contains high amount of cyanide. And cyanide is toxic. It's a toxic compound. So it is uh it is poisonous when uh ingested. So 
we need to prepare it appropriately if you have to take out the uh, cyanide in it and there are two types types we have the bitter and the sweet so those are the two types of uh, the cassava that we have we have the bitter cassava and the sweet cassava so uh, let me quickly say this you could be asked to uh, give similarities between the yam and the tuba you could be asked to give similarities between the yam and uh, between the yam cassava between the yam and cassava so the difference is that you can see let me quickly show so this is what the cassava looks like you can see this diagram here this is what cassava looks like that is the cassava uh, tuba or the manioc esculenta so this is another image of cassava you can see it in the stem you can see yes this is how the stem looks uh, so it is a root tuba so it has yes the yam and the cassava they are both root tuba so this is how it is when uh, planted so paraventure you are asked to give some similarities and differences between them now these are uh, differences between the cassava and the yam so you can go through them cassava root vegetable is rich in variety of essential nutrients and resistant starch but for yam yams are a variety of high nutritious root vegetables that have relatively low content of calories compared to cassava the cassava has uh, high calories while yam has low calories so you can look at their uh, distinguishing features here and so they also have a similarity majorly both of them are rich uh, their roots are uh, vegetable uh, rich in they are very very rich in carbohydrates and uh, calories so for the cassava it can be used to make gari to make fufu okay let me just put it here use this now for producing gari mashed cassava which is fufu uh, you could have cassava chips you could have cassava chips bread french fries french fries uh, cassava cakes tapioca and the rest of those so those are some of the things that we use uh, cassava for so paraventure you are asked so those are their uses so i listed to us earlier on what yam can also be used for and how it can be eaten so we need to get a uh, note of that so again these are the differences that you can see between yam and cassava so let us move to the next specimen now which is specimen j specimen j is orange fruit okay specimen j specimen j that is orange orange fruit orange fruit is a citrus orange fruit is a citrus so orange fruit is a citrus yes so what do we want to see about the orange fruit it is a true fruit yes if you want to talk about its classification uh, it moves from fruits to true fruits yes uh, to simple simple fruits which can be called monocarpus flower monocarpus flower yes to succulent and then to the esperidium yes that is where we find orange so it is a 
a waxy coated uh, uh, skinned uh, fruit it has waxy skin yes it has waxy skin then the placentation is exile placentation placentation the placentation of orange we have it to be exile yes it has exile placentation it has spherical it is spherical in shape with outer peel called epica spherical shape the spherical with outer coating called the epicap yes that is the outer coating and so it also have the underlining fibrous layer the underlining fibrous layer underlining fibrous layer called the mesocap and then the juicy part called the endocap the juicy part is the endocap so that is the uh, the component part of the orange it undergoes a sexual reproduction undergoes a sexual reproduction yes because we cultivate it uh, by seed so seeds are naked and they are not hidden i mean they are naked Seeds are not naked, so that is uh, that about orange. So it's we have two types of oranges types now. We have the sweet oranges as well as the sour oranges. So from the sweet oranges, majorly we get ascorbic acid. From the sour oranges, you have what? The citric acid. From the sweet orange, that is the normal orange. Uh, for ascorbic, now we can have, uh, uh, we have the likes of lemon, we have grape, we have lime. All of these make up the sour oranges. So, this is an example. Okay, for the sweet now, we have tangerine. Yes, we have tangerine and the normal orange that we know. So those are examples that can give us the sweet orange or the sour orange. So this is an example of what the orange is. So here we can see this part here is what we refer to. This part here is where we call the endocap. And then this little white part here, on the, between the endocap and the outer part, this little white part is called the mesocap and this outer part which is waxy you can see that it is oily in nature that is the that is what we refer to as the ecto uh, the epicap so those are the parts that we have for the uh orange so let me show us other uh parts so when you are asked but uh paraventure you are asked to draw uh a, a cut a transverse cut of an orange so this is how the transverse cuts look like remember i said it is uh, exile placented so it has a placentation that is exile in nature so we can see the placentation here you can see it all of the seeds are gathering towards the the middle so we can see the juicy parts you can see the mesocarp you can see the exocarp or the uh, epicarp then we have the endo endocarp as well so that is about the orange uh, fruit so the next fruit we are the next specimen that we have now our next specimen we have specimen so we have just talked about specimen 
uh, J. So we are going to specimen K now, which is ground nut cake. Specimen K, ground nut cake. All right, ground nut cake is gotten or made from ground nut. Yes, ground nut cake is, is made from ground nut. That is where we have the uh, material made from. This is what ground nut cake looks like. You can see it. So let me zoom into it. You can see. We call uh, in Hausa Yoruba they call it kuli kuli. That is what granite cake is. This is another uh, sorry, another picture of the granite cake. This is another picture for the granite cake. You can see it here as well. So that is what it is. That's the granite cake. So what do we what do we what do we refer to as granite cake? What do we mean by granite cake? That's what we want to quickly see yes i said it is made from ground nuts made from ground nuts and botanical name for ground nuts we call it we call it we call ground nuts arachis hypogea That is the botanical name for ground nut. It is a dicot. Let me just give us a little insight into it. It is a dicot ledonous plant. That means it has two seed leaves. It is also a legume. A legume. Yes, it is a dicot. It is a legume. It's germination. Its germination is hypogeal. Yes, because it remains in the soil. It remains in the soil after planting. Uh, then it is propagated by seed, then planted by uh, for human consumption. Yes, the granite is planted, planted mainly for human consumption. And animal forage that is why we plant it so it is planted for human consumption and animal forage now coming back to the granite cake itself what is the granite cake like i've shown us earlier on what uh, does it do yes it is a snack a popular snack that can be taken that can be eaten ordinarily or with gari sugar etc so we can eat it as a snack and you can take it as uh, a uh, a supplement to taking gari and the rest of those so it is a popular snack amongst uh, africans or let me say amongst nigerians so that is what granite cake is it is made from granite you actually mill the granite after roasting the granite you peel off the back then you grind or you blend the granite and after blending then you pour it into a mortar you add little seasoning to it and then you start what heating it and mixing it until it becomes a bit thick and when it is a, uh, a bit thick you start uh, 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 making it into shapes the shape you want it to have and in the process of doing all of this, you will be having, while you are uh, mixing, there will be extraction of oil. So there's going to be an extraction of a considerable amount of oil, which is the granite oil. Yes, in the production of granite cake, you get granite oil. So when you get this granite oil, it is the granite oil that you eventually have to fry the uh, baked granite after milling it and after pounding you bake it and then you fry with the oil that has been extracted from the granite cake before it can have this brown uh, nature because before it you have this brown feeling that you have on the screen uh, right now before it you have this brown nature that you have here so that is what it is so that is 
uh, coolly coolly for us or granite cake as the case is so our next specimen now the next specimen we have before us is the hides the hide is the next specimen that we have before us so what is the hide the hide is a particular substance okay let me quickly put this down specimen L specimen L hide hides and skin so that is the next specimen specimen L so what do we mean by hides and skin Hides are substances gotten from big animal. Hides are gotten from big animals. Big animals, e.g., we have buffalo, we have cow, yes. Uh, let me say uh, tigers and the rest of those yes etc and skin skin is gotten from small animals e.g. we have uh, goats we have rabbits cats etc so that's the difference so uh, the common commercial hides the commercial hides now are used in the production of leather they are used to make leather so all leather works that we have ranging from the leather that is used in making some clothes bag and the rest of those and they are gotten from animals like cattle from cattle alligator we have uh, snake skin, snake skin, uh, let's say box skin as well. All of these are used for making shoes, okay, used for making shoes, clothing. bags uh, belts etc so everything that is used or uh, made from leather materials these are where they get them from these leathers can also be used leathers in cars yes for the chairs and the rest of those or four trees interior decorations and the rest of those so all of this can be gotten from uh, hides and then the skin are gathered from hunting and processed at domestic uh, at, uh, and our artisan levels skin and hides gotten from hunting and then the process of tanning takes place. Tanning is a process used to convert to convert hides to leather. Yes, that is the process. So hides are used to process chews for dogs. Yes, we also use hides. to make chews for dogs yes that hard meat that dogs uh, chew on for dogs and skin is often eaten skin is often eaten by other animals so this is what the skin 
and the hide rather looks like you can see this this is what the hide looks like so this is from a deer a giraffe zebra and the rest of those so this is another example this is the processed work of uh, animal skin so our last specimen is going to be specimen m specimen m is our last specimen specimen m and that is the digestive tract digestive tract of uh, of a bird so it is also called gastrointestinal it is also called gastrointestinal tract yes also called gastrointestinal tract so this is what uh, what I'm saying looks like this is the gastrointestinal tract of the fowl or of a domestic bed you can see the diagram and the libelled parts so from the mouth to the crop the uh, proventricles which is the stomach to the gizzard which is the the ventricles to the liver the duodenum pancreas the liver and then actually digestion does not pass through the liver then into the small intestine uh, the, the system the colon and then the cloacia that is the part of the digestive tract so this is the uh, the digestive tract of the of the bed so what do we need to know about the digestive tract of the bed that is what we want to look at right now so like i said earlier on the digestive tract of the bed is also called the gastrointestinal tract so uh, let me quickly list some of the parts that we find in the uh, digestive uh, tract of a bed we have the bill or the beak we have the mouth the tongue the pharynx okay let me just list them i'll list them and then we'll, uh, quickly take the functions of each of these parts that is what we will do we'll list them and quickly take the functions of each of the parts so let us start from the beak or the bill that is where we're going to start from so the beak or the bill obtains food Okay, parts now and functions. So you could be asked to list some parts and uh, tell or explain the function or tell or state the function of any of the parts. So let's start with the bill, beak or bill. In some uh, textbooks, they call it bill. So its function is to obtain food uh, samples. obtain food and the food that the birds take is majorly grains so that is what the bill or the beak does and then we have the mouth so what happens in the mouth the mouth contains gland secreting saliva it, it contains a gland that secretes saliva uh, and the saliva helps to uh, mo make the food moist yes in the mouth we have gland secreting saliva and in that saliva there's an active enzyme called the amylase a digestive enzyme saliva containing digestive enzyme it contains digestive enzyme and the digestive enzyme uh, degrades the food. The digestive enzyme is amylase. The digestive enzyme amylase. And so the amylase helps to break the food down. The amylase acts on 
uh, carbohydrate or starchy food. Also, in the food, the saliva helps to make the food moist. Saliva also makes the food moist. So those are the things that happen in this part of the stomach. Uh, those are the things that happen in this part of the oh sorry of the digestive tract in the bill and in the uh in the mouth. So let's go further. We have the tongue. What's the function of the tongue? Is to push the food down the pharynx into the throat. Push food. down the pharynx into the esophagus. Some textbooks we call the esophagus throat. Some textbooks we call it uh, the uh, uh, gullet. Yes, those are the names that the, uh, that the esophagus is called. Esophagus throat or gullet. And then we have the esophagus now. The esophagus. In the esophagus, we have flexible tube connecting the mouth to the crop. Yes, that is where the food passes through from the mouth into the crop. Connects. Yes. Okay. Connecting tube. Linking the crop from the mouth. Yes, that is the esophagus. And then we have the crop. The crop is the next. So we have talked about all of this. So the crop is the next that we're actually talking about now. So the crop is an out pocket or an out pocketing of the esophagus. It is a storage site located just outside the body cavity in the neck region. Like I said, a storage site or a temporal site or state stage for feed and water before entering into the uh, before they enter into the digestive uh, system or the stomach or the uh, the proventricles. So. A temporal storage site for food and water. Yes, located just outside, located just outside. The body cavity in the neck region in the neck region so that is the crop for you and then we have the proventricles, uh, the proventriculus, which is also called the stomach. The proventriculus, also called the stomach. Digestion primarily begins here, and it has uh, HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. It has the hydrochloric acid and then digestive enzymes as well. Digestive enzymes like pepsin. Digestion starts here. Then contains HCl and digestive enzymes. E.g., we have pepsin. 
in this part and then after this we now have the ventriculus the ventriculus actually uh can also be called we also call it uh the gizzard we also call the ventriculus the uh the ventriculus we also call it the gizzard and its major function is for grinding or milling for grinding grains or milling grains that is what its own function is for for grinding grains and then after the ventriculus we now have what we refer to as the small intestine containing the duodenum the small intestine containing the duodenum the small intestine containing the duodenum and it is the site of nutrient absorption yes it is in this part that nutrient is being absorbed into the bloodstream of the animal site of nutrient absorption yes and after this we have the li okay let me move to the next page we have uh li okay specimen we are still discussing specimen m which is uh the digestive tract digestive tract of a bird so that is what we are still discussing that is where we are still uh, at the moment so we have discussed others let us continue so where we, where we are now is the system so what is the system okay we have talked about the small intestine so we are moving to the system the system now in the system in the system we have uh water being reabsorbed in the system we have reabsorption of water reabsorption of water and then after the system we have the large intestine we have the large intestine after the system and what happens in the large intestine that is the last site of water reabsorption last site of water reabsorption and after that we now have the cloaca we have the cloaca so what does the cloaca do the cloaca is responsible the cloaca is responsible uh, for mixing digestive waste and urinary uh, waste sites of mixture of site of mixture of digestive waste and urinary system and urinary system waste that is the urate rotten from uric acid so these are the parts of the bird that we need to know and we need to know their functions so we started with talking about uh the beak we talked about the beak or the bill sorry we talked about the beak or the bill after which we talked about the mouth so this is what you're talking about here the beak or the bill and then the mouth in the mouth is where we have the tongue 
uh, as well so the tongue also has its own function so in the the beak is uh, mainly used to obtain food or the grains then the mouth contains a gland that secretes what saliva that contains digestive enzyme called amylase and then the saliva also makes the food moist so it will be easy for the food to pass through uh, the esophagus then in the mouth again we have the tongue pushing the food down the pharynx into the esophagus then the esophagus connects the tube uh, the esophagus is the tube that connects or that links the crop from the mouth then the crop is a temporal storage site for food and water located just outside the body cavity in the neck region then we have the proventricle uh, the proventriculus or the stomach the proventriculus or the stomach which is uh, where digestion starts and it contains HCl which is hydrochloric acid and then the digestive enzyme like uh, pepsin. pepsin the HCl actually helps to prevent food from from rotting then we have the ventriculus the ventriculus or the gizzard ventriculus is also called gizzard so what does it do what does the ventriculus do one of the things that the ventriculus does is uh, to grind it helps to meal that is what it does it grinds or meals so it grinds the food that the animal eats and then we have the small intestine that contains duodenum site of uh, nutrient absorption that is what the duodenum is and then we have the next one which is the system the system the system actually helps uh to it helps in uh reabsorption of water that is what the system does to reabsorb water and then we have large intestine which is the site of water reabsorption as well and then the cloaca where we have the mixture of uh digestive waste and urinary system waste digestive waste and urinary system waste like uh the urates so those are the parts of the uh digestive uh, tract of a bed that we need to look at so uh the food that the birds eat they are converted uh, into nutrients by the body of the birds and they need it for growth maintenance and uh, production of eggs yes food eating that is the greens they are needed by the animals needed by the animals for production of nutrients Yes, needed for the uh, production of nutrients for growth, maintenance, uh, and production, and production of eggs. So that is what. Uh, we need to know about the digestive tract of a bed so let me quickly show us what that is again so this is how the digestive tract of the bed looks so this brings us to the end of this particular uh, lesson please for those of us who are yet to subscribe please subscribe to our channel so we can get more interesting topics across to you please like the page share the page with your friends subscribe and we will be expecting your comments in the comment section. Thank you very much and God bless.